I pressed the right button. I'm apparently good at people pressing people's buttons. I've proven that over many years. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for the, for the introduction. Thank you all for being here on the first day of GDC. The whole idea of these 30-minute talks is that we are trying to pack, in my case, 46 years of wisdom building games into 30 minutes. So I'm going to talk really fast like this, and you better listen really carefully because I'm going to go really fast like this, and it'll be all like that. Uh, no, I actually won't do that. But it will be a case, instead of me blurting 30 things I think are true, I'm actually going to take a few things I think are true and talk about them in detail. I'm going to go by, by this part quickly, but as I mentioned, I've been doing this for 46 years. Basically, I am a lucky guy. I've been at the right place at the right time uh, since 1971 uh, a number of times. The key point for this talk is I've been uh, CEO or GM of studios for probably a total of 30 years and a number of other years advising and coaching CEOs and GMs. And that's the part of my background as apart from game design or game production uh, that I'm bringing to this talk. Um, in the, the last few years in particular, I've been working both on original designs and working with teams, uh, really ranging from very tiny indie teams all the way up to uh, top 20 publishers in the world. So. Now, I want to tell you, I have a lot of opinions here. I think that you should be very, very cautious in the modern time about automatically accepting people's opinions. People who look like this, to me, are very suspicious Thank you, I agree. I would not trust this man, just from this photograph. In fact, I think I would want to run from whatever country he's gaining power in. So, um, so on that note, if I, uh, I do not have a requirement that you agree with me, if, I, if you find yourself in dinner tonight in a discussion or even a disagreement or an argument, a friendly argument, about things I say, I'm happy, because if you think about it and you're debating it, that's all I think that any speaker can ask. So that's my goal here. So here's the first point I want to make. When I first started running a company, when I founded my first company in 1988, uh, an advisor took me aside and he gave me one of many wonderful gifts I've been given by advisors and mentors over the years. And he said, let me tell you one thing starting out as a company, if I give you one thing, let me tell you what it is, and that is, cash is king. Not earl, not duke, not prince, but king. And by saying cash is king, I thought, okay, yeah, ca cash is king, that sounds good, okay, preserve cash, watch, I, people have told me that, watch out for cash, I've got that, okay. I'm gonna be careful with, my wallet's right here, I'm gonna be careful with cash. But he didn't stop there. He said, there's more to it than that. The thing about cash is, it's different from any other resource you have. If you run out of time for something, it sucks. There's a problem with your project, it ships late, a project can get canceled. It is not automatically dooming the organization. If you run out of resources, if you run out of printer paper or ink, if you run out of people to do a certain task, if you run out of anything, it's a problem. It could really create a chain reaction, but it's not fatal to the organization. If you run out of cash and you can't pay people on time, in the United States that is almost always fatal because of the way the laws work requiring how we do these things. And by the way, I think those are good laws because I like getting paid. So if you can't pay for your offices, if you have offices and you need them, you have a little bit of leeway there, but pretty soon the doors are locked and everything you own as a company is inside the office that is now with you locked out and they have changed the locks. So the reason why we say cash is king is because it is the single most precious resource you have. And if we think of it in game design terms, think of this business as being a game that has permadeath and the, this is the one resource that can kill you. If you think of it in those terms, you will protect cash in a different way. What we all tend to do starting out, and I can still catch myself doing this at the start of projects, even after I'm supposedly wise, is 
you're enthusiastic. Okay, we have to get machines for people. Okay, we need two more people to do this. Okay, uh, we don't have enough chairs. You start spending money, you're setting up the team, everything is new and it feels great. And spending that money, you're trying to spend it intelligently. But there is a pleasure in spending that money while you set up the company. At some point later, where you kind of go, okay, we're fighting for this deadline, you know, money is tight, we're really watching it. You're watching money in a different way. You're being more conservative, you're being more cautious with what you do with money. As veterans of starting companies and starting teams, one of the things you can do is start to look at, okay, how would I spend money late when it's tight? How can I take that same attitude and bring it to early in the process so that I make it less likely that money is tight later and if something goes wrong and it turns out we needed more of something than we have, that money is there. That is what he taught me about cash as king and it was a wonderful gift. But now there are more kinds of money, and I use this as my picture to illustrate this, but I'm not really talking about currencies. There are actually three kinds of cash, and this is a very important thing that I learned so, by experience. So kind of cash number one is if you look in your wallet or your purse right now, you will find some cash. That is cash you own. If you have cash in the bank that no one can take away from you, that's cash you own. So that's num type number one of cash. Type number two of cash is money that somebody can take away from you. Well, what are, somebody's, well, if I were robbed in the street, that would be somebody taking money away from me. I, I, that, would, I, that would be the cash out. That is not what I'm talking about. The money in your bank account is often, as a company, not all yours. For example, if you don't pay your payroll taxes, or some other kinds of taxes, the government can get an order and they can come and take the money from your bank account without your permission. So that is money you don't actually, any money you owe in taxes is no longer your money because you will either pay it directly or you will pay it indirectly out of your bank account. But that is no longer your money. It's money that can be taken away from you. If you get a credit card from the bank and you don't pay that bill, Typically, you're only going to get a card like that for a small startup business, startup business from the same bank you're banking with. Well, if you don't pay the bill, the bank will simply pay it for you. It's a service that we offer. We're very happy to do these things for our customers. Yes, we'll take your money and automatically pay something without your permission because it makes everything easier. So that's money you don't really control. The, the credit card company can come and they can take it. If you have investors, or if you have taken any kind of uh, other deal where somebody has advanced you money. For example, you've got a publishing deal and you've, you've been advanced money. If something is going wrong, typically in investment deals, the investors have the right to come and take what's left of the money and say, hey, this isn't going to work. It's not going to pan out. Don't spend any more money. We're just going to end it here. So that investment money you raised, if you read the fine print, normally is not money you actually own and control. If you have a deal with a publisher or a distributor and they give you refundable advances, if you look on the contract, it'll say, it may say refundable advances. You know, that would, that would only apply if, say, you engaged in criminal activity or you did something reprehensible or you simply left the country. That's the only case, and that doesn't, don't worry about that part of the contract, and no, keep moving, keep moving right along, nothing to see right here. But in reality, a publisher who wants to can almost always in introduce and create an excuse to say, oh, you know, this isn't going so well, we don't, you know, you, uh, you, you, you gave us a, a delivery, and you, you delivered it, and it, oh, it, it came in at two in the morning, and there's a penalty, uh, you're not supposed to do anything after midnight, so you have to give us the money back. I'm joking around about it, but that stuff does happen. So when you get an advance from a publisher or a distributor, you always want it to say a non-refundable advance. You would like it to say that explicitly, that it is a non-refundable advance. So if you ever do ship them something at two in the morning, you will not be facing any consequences. Final example 
if you have your personal bank account and your company bank account in the same bank and you have some loan or payment that you have taken out from that bank, you may have personally guaranteed it. In fact, if it's a credit card, you almost always will find the fine print you have personally guaranteed it. What that says is, oh, the company couldn't pay us. What a pity. Well, we'll just take it from you instead. So now not only do we have company money that you don't really control in your bank account, now suddenly you've got your personal money that you don't really control. So that's why thinking about that second kind of money is so important. So to recap, we've got our first kind of money, cash you got in your hand, cash that nobody else can take away. The second kind is cash that somebody can take away. And there are many ways for that to happen. The third kind of cash is cash you don't have yet. And I have many memories of, oh, I Don, Don, it's good to talk. How's the wife and kids, Don? Oh, good, I'm glad. Yeah, uh, the, the check will be there Tuesday. We'll FedEx it out Monday. The check will, yeah, oh, no, <laughs> nothing to worry about, Don. Everything's going to be fine. Yeah, check will be there on Tuesday. Well, Tuesday comes, and usually there's a FedEx delivery and there's a check, but sometimes there's not. And sometimes that check comes Wednesday. Sometimes it comes the following Monday, and some, sometimes it comes a couple of weeks later, and there have been a few times it never came at all. So money you don't have yet is not really cash at all. I call it the third kind of cash, but it is not cash. Because until you have it, it ain't there. The place I see this hurt people by accident, because in, in reality, almost all of the people I've done business with in this industry over decades have been trying to do the right thing, trying to be honest people. Where I see the greatest incident, incidence of this with teams that I advise is they have a good game, they're talking to some publishers, there's some interest there, there are discussions going on. And you feel really encouraged because the business development people are encouraging you. They're encouraging you because they like your product and they're thinking, hey, if we could do this, this could be cool. While they are saying, and they, are, they mean it when they're encouraging you, that is not an in almost all cases, it is not an intentional uh, way to, to blow smoke of any kind. And while they're saying this to you, they're saying to the company, hey, this could be cool. What do you guys think of this? And the company is reacting and there's an internal discussion about your game. All of us have a tendency, including me, to go home and go back to the team and say, hey, this is looking pretty good. They're really interested in it. We don't know what's going to happen, but they're interested. And we start to think about what we would do if we signed a deal. And we start to get to where we think of maybe cash. Well, it's not maybe cash anymore. Now it's probably cash. That's a psychological difference. Now we're handling cash differently. Then maybe we get offered a draft contract. You know, we're interested in this. We'd like to give you a contract and talk about the exact terms where we could do this. You're looking at the contract. They're, they're talking about terms in good faith. You kick some things around. You know, there's some things where you disagree, but it looks like it's very doable. And so you now have, hey, it looks like we're going to have a deal. And there's this moment where you turn to each other and you go, we could actually this could work, you guys. This could really work. And you start to think, wow, this is going pretty well. Maybe two, two weeks, we'll have the kickoff check. That could be very good. Two, we okay, two weeks. And now we start to think, hey, two weeks is cash. A few years ago, I had a conversation with a number of people who have run teams, run companies, are advisors. And we were all talking about how long do you think on anything other than a super simple small project, on any deal of any scope, from the moment where you start to feel good to the point where you have a signed contract, how long do you think that typically takes? And we were talking about it, the consensus we developed was 90 days. And you could be sitting there going, no, you're, you're, you're so pessimistic. 90, 90 days. I mean, if, if it looks good and you're having, I mean, your deals close faster than that. And they do close faster than that. It often does happen they close faster than that. They could be a simpler deal or whatever. But what happens is once we start to feel good, we're, we have a good link with the producer or whomever we're working with, we start to feel that something is imminent and we start working as if the deal were done. 
and it can be weeks, months, or never before the deal gets done. And that becomes a trap where a lot of cash can escape us very, very quickly. So remembering to think about those things is key. We also come down to the idea of we can have letters of intent. A letter of intent is a short form agreement that can tide you over while you're negotiating a contract. It can also tie you up and take away your negotiating freedom in the contract. Even letters of intent can take a while. I had a case once where I uh, was doing a deal that we ultimately signed. On September 1st, the uh, very senior level producer at the, uh, at the company said, no, this feels close. We should be underway shortly. Uh, I said, well, why don't we do a letter of intent just to kind of uh, cover it and, and make sure we have everything clear. Uh, so let's see, that was September 1st. On December 20th, I actually got the draft letter of intent. So it's about three months roughly to get, just to get the letter of intent. Uh, and we signed the deal on February 24th. So let's recap, let's see, September, October, November, December, January, and most of February, yes, almost six months from, this feels good, it feels like we're about to do it, and them saying, hey, th this is straightforward, no problem, almost six months. And that's a deal we signed. I've seen deals like that that never get signed. So that third kind of cash, it draws us, our optimism, our hope, our love for our game. If you're building a game, you love your game, and when other people love it, we, that's a great feeling. And I will tell you, I start to fall into the same thing and I have to keep reminding myself, three kinds of cash, three kinds of cash, third kind of cash, done, listen, listen, listen in there. But we have to watch that because once you're running a company, there isn't somebody else watching it for you. Once you're leading a team, there isn't anybody else watching it for you. You have to watch it for yourself. I use this slide of a chess game. Um, I, I just uh, published a book called From Dream to Delivery, which is basically about shipping projects from scratch, doing something you love. And I tell a story in there that I call the chess game, and it's basically one time when we encountered a company where they very deliberately tried to rip us off. Very large, very well-known uh, media company that deliberately had one executive in the company deliberately tried to steal several, several hundred thousand dollars from us simply by manipulating what they did with the contract. As I say, in my career, most of the people I've ever dealt with have been very reasonable, tried to be fair. You can argue about business terms, but they're fair. People like that do exist. They are rare, and you have to keep it in the back of your mind. That's why you want contracts. That's why you want letters of intent. That's why you check with lawyers about things. That's why you're careful, is you do find some people out there who are like that. I'm delighted to say what a small minority they are, but you have to allow for the possibility in what you do. Uh, Salvador Dali understood many things. Uh, he's the gentleman who painted this and many other paintings of this uh, type about 100 years ago. And that is the nature of time when you're an indie team or you're doing a startup. So rather than my telling you a lot about, about this issue, I want to ask you to please do an assignment outside of this session. Talk to some, more than one person who has been part of a startup, who has led teams, indie teams, and ask them the question, when you started out, you had an idea about how you would be spending your time. Once you guys got the team going, what was the difference between what you expected and how your time really was spent? Whatever you hear will be wisdom worth, worth listening to from any particular team. And if you ask a bunch of people that question, they may be some of the most valuable speakers you get out of GDC is just talking to them. Because the issue is inevitably, we don't end up spending our time the way we plan to. But by talking to other people, you'll get a diversity of answers to how that works and what the, what the deltas are. Petri dishes. There are many stories you can tell with Petri dishes. Yes, some sad, some happy. But here's the story I want to tell, because I'm a nut about game culture. If you are a game designer, and then you end up leading a team, you discover that the culture of running a company, a team in any area, any discipline, any technology, is in fact a game. And it's a game with very real stakes. It's a game that people care about and you want to keep your players playing, 
and you want to get great results and you want to win that game. And so I joke about it sometimes, but I'm actually dead serious when I say that the most important game design you may ever do is the culture of your company. So the way I think about it is if you picture if three of you were starting out on an indie project together, and you picture in a room, picture three petri dishes that have scattered microbes of whatever sort, and you put them on the table in the room, and then you bring in seven brand new petri dishes, you take off the top, you put them there in the table, you turn on a fan and leave the room for two days. When you come back, what's gonna be in the seven new petri dishes? It's going to be microbes that are remarkably like those in the first three. The first three of you, people, I've heard people say, well, there's only three of us. I mean, culture, I mean, we sit across the table from each other. Culture is sitting across the table from each other. That's true. But then you, if you bring in that fourth, that fifth, and that sixth person, you are transferring to them the good, the bad, and the ugly of how the three of you work together. You get to 10, 20. The first 10 then transfer that worldview to the next 10 and to the next 30 and the next 50. And being part of companies that started small and then went up to having hundreds of people, if there's something you don't like when your team hits 200, very often you can look back to something in the first 10 people and you can find the roots of where that went. So those petri dishes, as you keep bringing in new ones into the room, they will keep getting most of the same microbes. I have one piece of advice for how to deal with this issue, and that is to think about it. If you sit down by yourself, if necessary, or just with your core team when you're starting something, and this can be done for projects as well as for companies, and you say, hey, what do we stand for? What do we want to stand for? What will our team be about? If you could write three or four things just about what we stand for as people and as a team and it's like to work with us, what would those three or four things be? And you can debate them and argue them and then actually write them down. What that does, it means that to the degree we control ourselves, you're deciding what some of those microbes are in that first Petri dish. And you're deciding what kinds of people, in terms of character, not just skills, you want to bring in to be around you. So that's a very valuable and important thing. That's how you control how the bacteria grow and spread. Yes, spreading everywhere, across the entire world, spreading infection of a wonderful or terrible sort. It's all up to you. But you want to control, and you control by planning ahead and thinking about it. I love the expression on these women's faces. <laughs> if I were sitting that close to a flame that big, I think my face would look like that too. Now, my point in this slide is to think about when, before this restaurant started putting 150 people in a room with six of these things and setting them all on fire at once, they probably talked about exactly how to do this and they may have installed some processes and equipment to make sure they did not burn down the building, let alone any of their diners. When we set up teams, very often, you're with people you've already worked with, you're used to how you do things, and you just start working the way you've always worked. And that may work out great, it may be wonderful. But one thing I believe is, if you are trying to make a startup, a new team, an indie project a success, it is worth the time at the start to ask yourself a series of questions. Okay, how are we gonna organize this project? What are our pipelines gonna be? How does an art asset go from a concept sketch to being in the game and actually running properly in the game and not creating chain reaction problems when we install it in the game? And the same for every other kind of asset. How will we know we're on time? How will we track our progress? Okay, we, we, wanna, use, we, we wanna go agile, we wanna use Handsoft, we wanna use Favreau, we wanna use Jira, or whatever you're going to do. It actually matters less, in my opinion, what you choose, then it matters that you choose and that you start at the very beginning and you say, let's decide what to do. Having some system is what's critical. The system is what you pick and you're control, in control of your own fate. But I think that not choosing is where I see a lot of problems happen with teams.
a certain amount of the work I do is I get called in because teams are having problems. I would much rather get called in at the start before there are problems. And very often it's good people doing good work, but it is the lack of a consistent way to organize and know how they're going to do it that ends up uh, hurting them. So, so I would just say figure out at the start what is your process and pick or pick. You can picture if, if you're going to start six bonfires in a room with 150 people, there's a certain amount of planning. You need to take your planning equally seriously. I just like this picture. Um, I, what I think about with this picture is the, uh, you know, we've all seen dogs chase cars. What does a dog do when they catch a car? Normally they stand there and they look confused and they have no idea what to do next because they never conceived of catching the car. This is an unlikely outcome that we see pictured here of a dog chasing a car. But yet, very often we start companies, we start teams because we have a project we love that we believe in and we go out and we build that game. And we ship it and down the road we think it's going to make money. And then we have the question of, Oh God, what do we do next? What, 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 oh. So one of the things we have to think about is if you're actually starting a company and not just doing a project, is what do you want your company to be? What do you want your company to be when it grows up? That's a critical question. Again, the only one who will know the answer is you. But if you don't ask that question at the very start, you'll now be in a position where you finish your project and you don't know necessarily what to do next. And there's another issue that comes when you finish your project. And we see the lion family on the savannah feasting on the night's kill. They languidly stroll across the beach, feeling the feeling of full bellies for the first time in three days. Now, if you're a lion and you kill something big, First you eat a lot, and then you lie around. And eventually you go, oh, I gotta go hunt and kill something again. As game studios, what very often happens is we ship a game, we finish a project, and the next Monday, we have to know what we're gonna do to pay for the next paychecks for the team. And it really isn't fair because in a fair world, in my view, what would happen would be you'd finish Everybody could take some time off the way you can at a big company, and then you come back and you figure it out. The trouble is the payroll requirement keeps coming up from the bank during that time. The last two or three months of a project are very often crazed, and yet you have to be thinking about what are we going to do next, where is the next money coming from. What sometimes will happen to teams is they may not have thought about the big picture of what they want the full team to be, what they want the long term of the company to be, and they are so busy finishing one game they, they can only half-heartedly think about what they do next, then they do a great job on a game, release it, there's no money coming in yet from that game, and they don't have another project and they can run out of cash before they find that next project because sometimes it takes a while. Remembering that fact of we, we're not like the lions, we have to feed ourselves constantly it is one of the bad parts of what we do that we have to think about money that way, but we do. So I've talked about all sorts of problems. I would like for this slide to come up, thank you. I've talked about all sorts of problems. I wanna finish by talking about the other side and why we do this. This is an old board game that, uh, actually this, this board game was published for like 60 years before it finally was shut down. And when I was a kid, I grew up in an alcoholic family and about five o'clock at night, things would usually start to get rather loud and unpleasant around our place. And I would retire away into a corner in my room and I would play this game. And I played this game for years and years. And then later it turned out I got to design computer games and com computer baseball games were part of it, which was just incredible. But I, part of what got me through part of my life was this game, just plain old board game. If you do this for a while, you'll have people come up to you and say, oh, I played one of your games. And they won't tell you how great the level design was on level six. They won't talk to you about game mechanics. 
They'll tell you where they were when they played, who they were with, and why they still care enough now, one, five, 10, 20 years later, they want to tell you about it. That's because you didn't just entertain them for a couple of nights. That's because you got to them. You create a link between you and them that made their life more fulfilled, and they wanted to tell you because they now care about you because through your game, you showed that you cared about them. So why do we do all this? Why do we put up with all the crap, a lot of which I've talked about in this presentation? We do it because this is what we do. This is our dream. This is what we were made to do. I've done this 46 freaking years, and I still love to do it. I don't want to do something else. I can report that you can do this for 46 years and not get bored, because that's my experience. But we have to keep doing it, and to do it, we have to be willing to deal with the crap. We have to be willing to learn the negative parts of running a business, many of which are just incidental parts of the gameplay because God likes a well-balanced game. But we have to be willing to do it because this is an art form, and if we're gonna prove it to the world, and if we're gonna impact those lives and give them something to come tell you is a reason you made their lives better and they want to talk to you because you've linked to them and you connected to them with your game. We can't be discouraged about all this other stuff. We have to believe in ourselves, our teams, our projects, and our games. And we have to deal with the crap and go out and build what you were meant to build. That's the most important thing I could possibly say to you today. And thank you guys very much for being here.